why you have great co-hosts. So this session, uh, you will be able to go to this poll everywhere through the link that I just sent to you. Uh, and I will be presenting the results that come from that session, excuse me, from the poll into um, this virtual setting so that you can each kind of see what everyone else is responding to. Uh, so I'll give you a second to get to that link. Don't worry about putting your name in there, uh, since especially since it's going to be anonymous. Uh, the first question we are gonna be asking you is to just share a couple of words about how you're feeling today. Um, and they don't necessarily have to reflect one another, even if they're contradicting, that's fine. Let me share my screen so that you can all see the responses as they come in. We've got some folks who are tired and excited, fatigued, grateful, and certain. Yes, I mean, we are definitely in times these days where all of these can happen at once. Overwhelmed, focus, great. Uh, I know we have folks coming and calling in from very different time zones. So maybe you just woke up or maybe you just had lunch or you're ready for that afternoon happy hour. So we all might be feeling something different as we're all in different parts of our day. Excellent. For the sake of time, I'm gonna go ahead and move on to our next question. And that is how has, uh, or has your C grant program developed a DEI, which is diversity, equity, and inclusion, or a JEDI committee, which is justice, equity, uh, diversity, and inclusion committee? Wow, lots of folks responding here. We realize there are, there are more than one person from each program on the call. So this isn't necessarily a reflection of all of our programs at C grant, but the folks who are on the call whose programs may have a committee. And we put, I don't know, because some folks, you know, maybe there's a, a, sub, a subgroup or a subset of folks within your organization who are meeting and you just aren't familiar with what they're doing yet. Strong representation so far on this, excellent. We'll move on to the next question. Has your C grant program developed a DEI or JEDI vision statement or internal strategy? This could be something where you're just sharing your values, uh, a vision statement that reflects DEI, or maybe it's a, ten, a reflection of the 10 year roadmap or, or other kind of strategy that reflects DEI or JEDI. Yes, for the most part, um, looks like a lot of you all in this call have programs that have engaged in some level of uh, committing to DEI in, as your organization. Okay, so we are not uh, gonna be using this question just yet, but we have this open here. Um, the question is, what questions do you have for any of our speakers? Please indicate Brandon or Jane if, you're in, uh, for, if there's a specific person that your question is intended for. Uh, as we have a couple of different speakers today, we have some breaks in between that we will um, be asking our speakers some of the questions that you put into this box uh, and uh, this is the space where uh, you can share your questions anonymously rather than through the chat box on Zoom. If you have any questions, please do send me a message in chat and I'm happy to help um, navigate either the poll everywhere or Zoom or find somebody else. Uh, but this time I'm gonna pass it on to Mona. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, wherever you are. Uh, before I introduce the speakers, uh, I just wanted to briefly acknowledge uh, all the hard work of Carolyn Foley from Illinois, Indiana Sea Grant, who is who's been helping us with just about everything. So big lift, uh, Carolyn, thank you so much for everything. Also, Karen uh, MMC, uh, Karen Morrill from, uh, I believe, from Washington Sea Grant, they have helped us a lot uh, in uh, organizing these professional development uh, webinars and, and um, uh, 
contributing to making this a successful meeting. So thank you all. Um, it is my honor today to introduce uh, our keynote speaker, Dr. Brandon Jones. Dr. Brandon Jones is the program director for the education and diversity programs at the NSF Geosciences Directorate. Um, Brandon is also the board member of American Geophysical Union. He is the, if you haven't voted already, he is running for the president elect position with American Geophysical Union. He's also a member of the Dean's Advisory Committee for the University of Delaware's College of Earth, Ocean and Environment. Um, also a board member for the Environment Leadership um, uh, Program. Uh, and, and in addition to Brandon, we also have Dr. Jane Harrison. Uh, Jane is a North Carolina Sea Grants Coastal Economist, uh, Economic Specialist, and she's also the co-lead for our uh, Sea Grants Community of um, Practice, uh, JEDI Community of Practice, or DEI Community of Practice, as we've been calling it. So without further ado, let me uh, switch and hand it over to Brandon. Brandon, please take it away and most welcome. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Mona and Sarah and all those who um, organized Melissa for the, um, the the music moving into this session. Uh, I, I, I almost had to go listen to Motown or something. To, I was getting kind of amped up there listening to uh, Janelle. So anyway, uh, that's the first time I've ever been in a meeting where um, the, the music that I think is capturing a lot of sentiment uh, among people nowadays, and rightfully so, um, uh, so that, that was, um, I think that was appropriate. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen and just uh, get right into things. I know I um, have maybe 15 minutes or so. Uh-oh, I don't have permissions to share. Um, I will need that. So let me know. Just set you as co-host, so you should be able to share now. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Yes. Thank you. All right. And please let me know when you see. Is that showing up? All right. Thank you. Uh, so. Uh, here's uh, the, the title, Science Does Not Conduct Itself, so who's conducting, and let me move this over. So uh, what we'll try to do today is just go through um, some information, some thoughts of mine, uh, but also some data uh, and um, perhaps some framing that will help us figure out how to move forward in this space that is uh, all kinds of acronyms, but it's this uh, really sense of belonging that is important. Um, so I want to start with not that this, that everyone knows who that is on the right, uh, and, and not that Darwin is my favorite scientist, uh, but I do recognize his humanity as far as being conflicted on some of his theories as he matured in his uh, scientific career and, and observations and things of that nature. And so in The Descent of Man, um, at, in his last chapter, uh, he really, in the last few chapters, he really gets into uh, some social science perspectives uh, that show the conflict that he had uh, as it relates to what he wrote earlier in The Descent of Man when he talks about uh, certain groups of people that he observed around the world and how he felt about them, which wasn't always in a positive light. Uh, but this quote here, he begins in the last chapter of Descend of Man to talk about morality. He talks about sympathy and he talks about them being traits that are necessary for humans um, and, and in that context of, of traits being passed on for the, ne the necessity and the survival of a, of a species. And so I highlight um, out of the quote, this, this first phrase or clause, a moral being is one who's capable of reflecting on his past actions and their motives of approving of some and disapproving of others, okay? And that is a distinction that he uh, puts forward and, and certainly says that humans have this capability uh, while in his observation, uh, animals or the lower animals don't. So I want us to keep that in mind about morality as we're moving forward in this discussion on Jedi 
the, the take home messages uh, that I want you to focus on are here. The STEM workforce cannot operate at full capacity if all available qualified minds are not engaged. That just that that's just kind of the way it is. If everyone who's available and qualified to be part of it is not part of it, then then that enterprise is not at 100%. And secondly, individuals who are in the workforce cannot operate at full capacity if they are stressed. That's any organism has an optimal range of whatever those factors are that allow that organism to, uh, it, uh, in the words of the Army, be all that it can be. Um, and that's the same, obviously, for humans in the research enterprise, the educational enterprise, the work enterprise, et cetera. And thirdly, our planet's facing all hands on deck problems. Many of you have heard this over the last months or even a couple of years, but all hands are not on deck and we can't afford to continue to perpetuate barriers that don't allow other perspectives to come in to help us because we only have one planet. Um, and uh, we, you know, we, we need to uh, be in this thing together um, and solve these problems uh, from a, a holistic point of view versus and in some instances, a uh, uh, sort of a unidirectional um, um, approach that we've done in the past. So if you take those three and you kind of sum it up, uh, you have this statement here, in my opinion, individuals are not able to bring all of themselves to the research enterprise. And so the, the enterprise is hindered and then individuals themselves um, are, are also stunted as far as their development and what they can bring uh, to not only science, but to society. So um, well, everyone has acronyms here. And when you're talking to uh, science folks and you are a scientist and you try to be cool, but your daughter still tells you that you're a nerd, you just embrace the nerdiness and you throw up something like Jedi so it's easy to remember. And since we binge watched The Mandalorian, I wanna be a Jedi. And uh, the B, um, and you see the, the explanation for each of the uh, letters there that make up this acronym. So sense of belonging is, in my opinion, the, the paramount focus. And so belonging is the supportive environment. And the way we get to having supportive environments for individuals so that they have a sense of belonging is through the work of JEDI, which is justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion uh, with some descriptors there. Um, and, and so often, and we'll get into this in a couple of slides, in a few slides, uh, diversity has been the catch-all term, uh, but we wanna make sure that everyone is aware that uh, diversity has its own meaning and it has its own place in this work, but there's so much more to what these efforts should entail and uh, very encouraged from the Poll Everywhere survey at the beginning of this session to see that many Sea Grant programs have developed um, statements and, and are moving forward um, on some very intentional actions as it pertains to, um, to JEDI issues. When we're talking about JEDI, at least from my, uh, my vantage point, we're, we're talking about multiple perspectives. We're talking about how you value those perspectives. When we're uh, having conversations in this earth system science space, ocean sciences, atmospheric, what have you, uh, you look at the spheres here, and this is where a lot of training and education and research preparation is focused. It's, it's been on lithosphere, bio, cryo, atmosphere, and hydrosphere. So studying the earth, the earth systems. And not too much focus, at least in what we refer to as the geosciences at NSF, on the anthrosphere. What is the human uh, impact on these systems and where do humans fit in these systems and we need to study humans because science is a social enterprise. Okay, as the title says science doesn't conduct itself research does not conduct itself. And the best research is done with teams and collaborations and partnerships, and you have to develop relationships. Um, and so it's all about that social part that we're emphasizing uh, when we are talking about Jedi. When we're talking about Jedi and we're really real about what we are discussing and want to do, uh, we're gonna run into some uncomfortable truths and, and we have to confront them head on. So uh, one of the best musicals ever, in my opinion, is, is uh, Hamilton. And one of these, the great songs that came from that is Immigrant, well, it was part of a song, Immigrants, We Get the Job Done, okay? Now, 
that was the mindset at the beginning of the United States, uh, part of the mindset, I should say. That, and it still trails through many of the policies and even in today and some of the ideologies that have been put forward politically and in and, um, and states and at the federal level. That if you're an immigrant, you come to the US, you work hard, uh, the system is there for you, you, you put your work in, you do what you're supposed to do, you follow the, the rules, you pick yourself up by the bootstraps, you have grit, you have determination, et cetera. If you're an immigrant, but we can't just gloss over the fact that there were hundreds of millions of people that were already here. They weren't immigrants, uh, Native Americans, indigenous, um, and that includes Mexican Americans and Puerto Ricans and, and other groups. They weren't immigrants. And we certainly are aware of and can't gloss over the fact that um, Africans were kidnapped and brought here. So they, were, they weren't uh, uh, voluntarily, they didn't voluntarily immigrate here. So when those policies were set forth uh, to, to create the country, these people were not, they, they were not in, in, in the, the, that wasn't the, the, the group of people that the constitution and other policies were designed for. And it just so happens that it's these groups of people that we still have an issue with as far as recruiting, retaining, supporting, mentoring, training, et cetera, not just in science, as you see here, not just in the geosciences on this, this graph, but in society, period. So you, we just have to step back and look at that. It's not about those groups of people, those individuals. Um, in the case of geosciences, over 40 years, we've had all kinds of upfront work for internships and REUs and high school programs and trying to recruit undergrads into our programs and things of that nature um, from different racial and ethnic groups. And many of you have seen this, uh, this graph from this paper in 2018. But, and this is focusing on in the academy, uh, the number of PhDs in those groups has remained flat over the last 40 years. Okay, Even with all of that upfront work to recruit people in. And you know, so, so we have to step back and say, okay, what, what's going on here that the retention is so low as they're moving up through the system, bachelor's, master's, PhDs, at least in uh, academia, that, the re that, that we're not retaining or, or not getting a return on the investment that we're putting in upfront. And so if we go back to 1972, um, this was a, uh, the first national conference on minority participation in the earth sciences and mineral engineering. So this is really solid earth, but it was sponsored by the Department of the Interior and Colorado School of Mines. Um, so this was 1972 that there was a recognition both by the federal government and academia that uh, you know, something intentional needed to be done for the recruitment and retention of underrepresented folks in what we call the geosciences. So, we're talking about half a century's worth of work here, and we still are having issues. So we, we, we have to be critical as scientists. We have to be critical about what it is that's not working. If we have assumptions about the who that is conducting scientific research, then those assumptions will move through everything that we try to create for as far as programs and hiring and position descriptions, et cetera. Okay, so in this book, uh, The Loudest Duck, the uh, author draws a comparison uh, between a US or a Western adage, which you see over there on the right hand side that says the squeaky wheel gets the grease. We know that we've heard it. Okay, you got to speak up, you got to have your place at the table, you got to be seen, you got to be heard. That's very Western. In The Loudest Duck, the author relays a story of. Uh, parents in China and other um, Asian countries who tell their young people and their students and their children that the loudest duck, which is like the squeaky wheel, gets shot. They don't get the grease. They don't get the resources. You, you, you're not supposed to be putting yourself out there. So when we're collaborating with colleagues from other cultures, and not just international, but within the US, uh, we have to have an awareness that 
they're different. They're not like us. They weren't raised like us. They have different norms. And those norms are as valuable as the ones we have. And it really doesn't have anything to do with how science is done. It's can we make science available to all so that they can bring all of themselves? So that's who. We also have to look at where science is conducted. And we're going to run into some really, uh, it, it's blatant, but sometimes we gloss over it. Uh, for instance, the development of our national park system. It was, there was ethnic cleansing, it, it, period. It, it just was. And, and this article lays out how John Muir's vision uh, was afforded uh, an opportunity to be the leading vision in the creation of the national park system, along with the president at the time, Theodore Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt. So there was the collaboration. But John Muir's vision was an uninhabited wilderness vision versus previous versions that included the indigenous peoples on those lands. And so where research is conducted now, uh, very extractive in many of the geoscience disciplines where you just go in, take samples and leave or, or interview and leave with no thought as to the land, the people, the culture, the heritage and the history there. That could be very helpful, for instance, in climate science. Um, so again, as I mentioned, if you have these false assumptions and you are developing actions based on these assumptions, you're going to end up probably creating an effort or an activity that's not going to be as useful for as many people um, as it could be. So with those bad assumptions in mind, or not necessarily bad, but they're biased, I should say, we've developed all kinds of programs, REUs or um, uh, positions in our departments uh, or at Sea Grant, just come here, it's gonna be the best thing ever. If you work here, you, you'll love it. You'll get this great experience. And the in time and time and time again, from that graph of the low retention in many groups and not just race and ethnicity, the individuals came and they had a horrible time. Okay. How do, and then it's dismissed as well, maybe they weren't the right fit. Maybe they didn't have what it took. Maybe they just didn't have the grit. Well, we tried all of those kinds of things. Uh, and the statements that we make reflect the assumptions and not really the critical uh, analysis that we need to have on what about the environment that maybe made one fish sick, but over the last 40 to 50 years has made a whole lot of fish sick. So once you get to the point where every time a fish enters your system, it gets sick, you can't keep talking uh, about how the fish <laughs> are the problem. Okay, the water is the problem. And because the water is the problem and it's impacting humans who conduct the science, we need the experts along with us to help us deal with that. So I'm running out of time, I'm gonna speed up a little bit. We need social scientists in the room, which means scientists have to get, traditional uh, natural and physical scientists have to get over their bias of working with social scientists. And to that end, NSF has a program now, some of you are aware of it, called Golden Geoscience Opportunities for Leadership and Diversity, expanding the network where this program focuses not on the early career, not on the undergrads or the graduates or the postdocs, but focuses on the leaders, the uh, faculty, deans, chairs, heads, um, what's going on in the environments, the managers, the supervisors, um, directors, et cetera, and what do those individuals need in those leadership positions to create welcoming environments and cultures so that the individuals that are being socialized into those positions um, can thrive, okay? So we're rounding this back out to Darwin, uh, the highlighted language at the bottom of another quote he had, where he says, um, you know, once an individual realizes that uh, maybe they haven't done what they were supposed to and some bad decisions were made, they resolve to act differently for the future. And that's what gives us a conscience. And that's where we are today. So some considerations, and I'm gonna move quickly through these. Mentoring and allyship, many of you are aware of that there's been a lot of discussion and scholarship on those. Um, of course, those are important. The asset language versus deficit, I touched on this. It's not the individuals that are at risk. These are 
are qualified individuals that are put in risky situations. So that's just an example of how you, we can, I should say, flip asset discussions, I mean, uh, flip deficit discussions and frame them as assets. There's been a lot of scholarship, as I mentioned, um, in this, particularly in the geosciences as it relates to efforts uh, with the social scientists and others um, in uh, increasing uh, equity and, and justice and, and diversity and inclusion. Um, and so I would uh, encourage you to take a look at this recent volume in this journal. Uh, we also have to look at uh, that bias impacts everything that we do. And uh, not that it's bad or good, uh, but if it's used in a way that filters people uh, in, in the most time, then it, it is used as a bad thing. And that includes hiring, awards, appointments, tenure and promotion, recruitment and everything else. We have to recognize that. We have to recognize there are multiple ways of knowing, just not the Western approach. Uh, for people who are encountering other cultures that are outside of their own, but you're really intentional about including those cultures, it's okay to be quiet and just listen. And there's a whole lot of others, but I, I knew I needed to stop there, so I will stop there. Um, so we have time for the other speaker and uh, Q&A and discussion. So thank you so much. Brandon, that was wonderful. Thank you for helping us kick off this session. Uh, let's see. So uh, if you have questions for Brandon, uh, please put them in the chat or share them using the poll everywhere function. Uh, we're going to take a few minutes now just for any clarifying questions from Brandon. Uh, and uh, the praise is rolling in now, Brandon. Uh, I don't know if you're looking at the chat, but uh, there are over 100 people on this call, and so lots of exclamation points coming through the chat. Um, but you can also share uh, questions using the poll that Melissa provided. Um, we'll have a little bit more time after Jane's presentation uh, for additional questions. Um, Sarah, we do have a couple of questions for Brandon. My apologies, I'm not able to paste them into the chat window, but I... I can read them, I can read a question loud and then try. So um, the first question to you, Brandon, is um, I would love to hear from both speakers or either about ideas or best practices for recruiting diverse student and faculty researchers and grant applicants as opposed to in hiring for C grant internal positions. So the, the question specifically is about considerations when recruiting? Yes, recruit, recruiting diverse students and faculty researchers. Um. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a common question. And it's, um, it, it's one of those questions that uh, kind of continues to look at what can be done on that front end. And I would, which is important, um, but one thing I would first consider on consider when wanting to recruit or hire, et cetera, is what's being done in that environment that those individuals will be recruited into to ensure that they, as much as possible, can operate at 100% or full capacity. So um, if the culture hasn't changed over 30 years in, in, in the department or the program, um, maybe there needs to be some amount of effort that looks at that, as well as uh, connecting with professional societies where there are large memberships of underrepresented students and faculty and, uh, and, um, and scientists. So uh, NAB, National Association of Black Geoscientists, or SACNIS, um, Chicanos and Native Americans in Science, ACES, which is Native Americans. Um, so there, there are, and then there are growing smaller uh, professional societies that um, the Geo, Geo Latinas, uh, uh, Geoscience Alliance, which is uh, native focused. Um, so there are many of these now that individuals can connect to and find all kinds of highly qualified candidates at all levels. I hope that helped. Yeah, thanks, Brandon. Uh, let's see, there's been a couple of questions entered. I wanna ask this one in particular. 
Uh, someone is asking, can you please elaborate on the Golden Program? How does it engage leaders and suggestions for other fields to engage in similar types of work? Yeah, um, good question. So gold, it started out as gold that came about after a recognition of a, a, a longstanding program in NSF called OEDG, which was uh, Opportunities for Enhancing Diversity in the Geosciences. And that was front end focused, teachers, high school, undergrad, et cetera, on that recruitment piece and preparation. Uh, we found as we were uh, kind of doing a, an analysis of that program after 10, 12 years or so that the teams of researchers or the individual PIs that were really successful with those programs, um, they had qualities that the other teams did not. And we wanted to figure out how could we identify those qualities and then maybe design curriculum or training or workshops to get that information out um, across the federal government, academia, et cetera, so that people could start to think about at the leadership level, at the gatekeeper level, at the high, at the supervisor level, what do those individuals need as far as professional development so that they are, since they're in the positions for hiring and recruiting and, and creating culture, uh, what do they need to ensure that, that the culture is welcoming? So that's a little bit more about gold. Um, it's, it's, it's academic focused now. Um, it's a, still kind of in its early phases at, at NSF. We just made 18 awards this past uh, late summer, um, and they can be found. I can share that information with, um, you know, Sarah, Mona later, and they can get it out to the whole group so you can you can kind of take a look at that. Great, thanks, Brandon. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna ask this uh, one final question before we move on to our next speaker. This is more of a thinker. So if you're feeling like you want more time, uh, maybe we can bring this question back up. Uh, so Jane, you're sort of thinking about this too, uh, but this might be a question that comes back around. The question is, uh, how does one evaluate the state of the immediate environment, the working environment? You know, you talked a lot about the toxic environment. And so what, what are some ways that we can assess that? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll offer one thing off the top of my head, but I would have to, to think more about it. Uh, so as I mentioned, the social scientists uh, and social being uh, you know, a, a large umbrella, um, but there are uh, people out there that have the expertise in organizational management and organizational climate and all of those kinds of things that I would encourage you to reach out to. There may be some on, on your campus and your, um, there, you, some larger institutions have whole centers or um, you know, departments that, that do that. Maybe in the education, the College of Education or so, there may be some uh, folks in there that have that expertise. So you'll have to um, be encouraged to look outside of your, your normal circle uh, for the expertise that you want to, to be applied there. Excellent. Thanks for that thought, Brandon. And yeah, you can continue. Uh, that one definitely may, may, might require a little additional brain power. So um, I think we're ready to move to our next speaker. Uh, Mona, would you like to do the honors? And thank you, Brandon. Uh, much appreciated. Don't go anywhere. Uh, we ha we'll have more questions for you. Fantastic. Jane, take it away. Jane, the wiser, the better, um, uh, the, 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 the more, the more appropriate uh, uh, one, uh, one of us, uh, I, I think I introduced Jane already. She's a coastal economist specialist with North Carolina Sea Grant and is also the co-lead for uh, the diversity, equity, inclusion community of practice with Sea Grant. So Jane, please take it away. Sorry, I had a brain fart there. <laughs> Thanks, Mona. Uh, lovely introduction. None of it is true. Um, so good to see you all. Um, great to be here today. And, and thank you so much, Brandon, for joining us. Um, we really appreciate um, your, your being here, your expertise, and any external support and thoughts we get on these topics I find really valuable as we move forward. Um, I just want to go over a little bit of where we've been as a network on some of these issues. Um, so I'm just going to provide some recent Sea Grant history. Um, and, you know, this is not all encompassing. It's uh, my, my general understanding of what we've been up to working on DEI and JEDI and 
how we've been trying to become Jedis. Um, so um, first, I do want to acknowledge um, I do uh, live um, in the traditional territory of the Tuscarora people. So I'm here in this red star, also known as Raleigh, North Carolina. I'm very grateful to work in the coastal areas of the state. Um, so all these areas next to the blue um, are also the traditional territories of many other um, indigenous groups, um, groups that many uh, still inhabit these areas. So uh, Croatan, the Wakama, the Lumbee. Um, and I just want to say that, you know, I'm really grateful for their stewardship. Um, and I think all those really that come before us, they help to pave our future. So I hope we can kind of continue in that lineage. Um, so what have we been up to? I want to, uh, oh, just get you thinking about warm soup. Um, I know this has been a hard month um, and for some of us and, uh, you know, I like to put on a pot of soup when things seem tough. So what have we been throwing together in our pot when it comes to DEI? A few elements. So one of the ingredients that we really started with, this was a great base in my opinion, um, was the DEI community of practice. This group started in 2016. Um, it formed out of some sessions at the Mid-Atlantic Sea Grant meeting, as well as the uh, Sea Grant uh, week um, in Rhode Island. And that group has been an ongoing source of inspiration for myself and I think many others. We really just started with conversation and trying to understand some of these topics. Um, most of us who work on DEI were, were not, you know, diversity experts. We didn't come from some background in any of these topics. Um, I happen to be a social scientist, so I think that, you know, is part of my interest. Um, but you know, lots of learning has happened um, over the past five years. And so we provide, you know, information to one another, we share resources, we encourage one another. Uh, we have a listserv, we do regular professional development uh, sessions um, like this one. Uh, one of our first products we created was a best practices case study. So what was going on across the network that we wanted to highlight and kind of look to for again, some inspiration and modeling. Um, and then after we had formed, we had the uh, uh, luck, I would say, of getting to um, craft a 10-year vision plan. So the National Sea Grant Office offered funding in 2018 to craft these plans, and our community of practice was just kind of ready to get going and think about where do we want to go. We had started to learn where we'd been, what were some of our challenges, and we were ready to carve a path forward. So that vision plan really helped, to, helped us to do so, um, and I'll go over more of that in a moment. A few other ingredients, supportive leadership. This is huge. So we have had um, you know, amazing support from the National Sea Grant Office, the Sea Grant Association, um, our directors, our managers of our state Sea Grant programs. And then just one uh, more ingredient that was thrown in, sometimes you don't know what's gonna come into the pot, um, but was our Canals Fellows. They actually formed their own JEDI uh, committee. And so we've been in communication with them, learning from them, uh, you know, them supporting us in different ways. So these are just a, a few of the elements that have made a, a decent stew thus far. Um, I want to uh, just emphasize though that we have had uh, participation from all 34 Sea Grant programs across the country over this time period. And many folks within these programs have become kind of the de facto champions, uh, let's say, of DEI topics within their own state Sea Grant program. Um, and then they have found more champions. As they started talking about these issues, they realized, oh yeah, my office mate also wants to work on this, or my colleague across the state is, is really interested. And so it's been very cool to see this grow. And so for, I know some of you, this information is old hat, but for those of you that are just coming in um, in the last year or so, we're so glad that, uh, that you have this interest. So when we were creating our 10-year vision plan, we were um, uh, you know, doing a, a number of things. Um, we actually uh, did a DEI climate survey 
Um, so we were, uh, you know, put a survey out to the entire network to understand some of our diversity when it comes to demographics, to understand um, some of the, the culture of work that we have, um, folks' satisfaction with culture, uh, dissatisfaction, as well as ideas for improvement. Um, while we created this vision plan, it was, you know, a year long engagement process. Um, and we had a number of experts that kind of helped us think through things. Um, just on this slide, back in the days when we would get together, this was uh, Charleston, South Carolina. Um, and on the left, um, the first speaker there is NOAA Civil Rights Office Director, that's Kenneth Bailey. In the middle is uh, Sockness co-founder, the Society for the Advancement of Chicanos and Native Americans in Science. Uh, Lydia Viacomarov, and then on the right is Mickey Sager, um, and she works for an environmental nonprofit in North Carolina, the Conservation Fund. And so they came, they told us their stories um, of how they've thought about belonging and inclusion and diversity and, you know, really helped to shape some of our, our early thinking. And they also reviewed our vision plan, which was very helpful. Now, if you're wondering, you know, what do we come out you know, with in that vision plan, if you haven't taken a look at it yet, um, these are some of our goals and they relate to administration, research, extension, education. I don't wanna get into any one of these, but I will say that we are actually in the midst of updating the plan as new folks have gotten involved with this work. They've really brought some excellent ideas to our attention for how to you know, really kind of further develop our ideas here. So you'll see some edits and some updates coming out um, possibly this uh, winter 2021. Um, but this is you know, kind of a starting point that a lot of Sea Grant programs will use to look at this vision plan and think through, okay, what is it that we wanna do? What makes sense you know, in our state? And one of the examples of, I'd say, a result from this work is we have formed the Community Engaged Internship Program for undergraduate students. Um, I would guess most of you are, are somewhat familiar with this, but I know only a few programs have participated so far. Um, we had our first cohort of undergraduate students um, participate in 2020 in the summer, so a virtual remote experience. Um, these are paid internships for students from under-resourced, underrepresented, and indigenous communities. Um, and one of the you know, real aims here is to broaden participation in coastal ocean and marine sciences. Um, there are a couple links here that um, maybe one of uh, my co-hosts can put in the chat. If you're just looking for general information about the program, check out our webpage. If you want more detailed, um, what we call our frequently asked questions, um, the many emails that, that Mona and I and others get wondering how this program works, please check out this new facts document. We have a wonderful um, uh, internship coordination committee um, that has kind of crafted those responses. Um, and this is just an example of one of our interns um, who uh, was funded by Michigan Sea Grant um, so David has given a, a couple talks, I think, um, in different spaces now through the Sea Grant net Network, uh, David Martinez Vasquez. Okay, so I am going to near the end here, and I just want to, uh, you know, kind of end talking about what does it mean to be successful in these spaces. And I have come up with a couple uh, metrics here um, with the you know, kind of help of of many folks uh, in the community of practice as we think through, are, are we getting where we wanna go? Um, so we've done a lot of professional development. Um, you know, we can count the number of attendees. Um, we could evaluate knowledge gained. Um, we did some uh, polls earlier, Melissa uh, posted for you all. Now we can understand, you know, it sounds like about half of this group, so maybe 50% are part of programs with a DEI vision statement, with a DEI committee. Um, we could start, you know, looking at the diversity of our staff, our stakeholders, our program participants, funded students. We could do more of these climate surveys. There's a lot of ways to measure success. I will say we're not doing any one of these in, um, perhaps a systematic fashion. Um, so far, our work has really been um, 
maybe a labor of love and real focus, um, kind of passion. Um, but at the same time, I do wonder as we move forward and we try to bring more people into the fold on some of these topics, is measuring you know, some of these things gonna help us you know, kind of move the needle forward? So I appreciated Brandon's kind of consideration of looking at the data over time. Are we making progress? And if we're not, you know, then evaluating the interventions that we've tried and trying to tweak them as we go along. If you're not on listserv yet for the DEI community of practice, please uh, email me, I'll add you. And if you're looking for more resources, so whether that's past webinars, um, uh, great readings, um, the DEI vision plan, our best practices paper, you can check it out at this link. Um, and perhaps someone can add that to the chat. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Jane. That was a wonderful uh, overview of uh, Sea Grant's uh, DEI efforts. Um, and also, uh, your timing was exquisite. So uh, we're going to start with some uh, questions specific to you and your presentation. Um, but uh, if folks have other questions for Brandon, as well as Jane, we'll have a few extra minutes to uh, maybe return to some of the more thought provoking questions. Um, but feel free to add uh, additional ones in the chat or via the link uh, provided um, through the poll. Okay, so uh, Jane, let's see. So this question, uh, I love the way this was asked. Uh, the uh, Asker says you can't rush a good stew. Uh, so wondering, uh, you know, you did a really nice job at the end talking about the benchmarks and you know what gets measured gets done. So I guess a, a way to ask this question is with the revisioning of the DEI plan, are there any, um, uh, are, are you guys thinking about, is there an intent to add some metrics as some benchmarks uh, in that new plan? Um, Mona, I might ask you to jump in on this one as well. Um, you know, I think one of the challenges, you know, when we come up with a national plan is that not all of the, you know, state sea grant programs are going to be at the, at the same point, um, you know, looking to achieve the exact same goals. And so thus far, we haven't put those kinds of detailed metrics together. Um, it's something that, um, you know, there's a DEI committee at North Carolina Sea Grant, and we're starting to talk through what would that look like for us. Um, and so that's, that's a place where I, I almost kind of wonder, or I would like to see some experimentation from state Sea Grant programs before we created national metrics. Um, but I'll uh, maybe also ask Mona to weigh in there. Nothing to add, Jane. You're absolutely right. I think it's uh, it's the entire visioning process has been a bottoms off process. And like Jane mentioned, none of us is a DEI expert. Um, we've kind of all, you know, collaborated and prepared this two together. So I think it's going to be up to all of us um, to leverage the expertise of our evaluation co uh, colleagues, social scientists, um, and as we as we develop our own DEI vision plans, uh, state sea grant programs too, you know, I think there's the opportunity to improve and enhance uh, the the 10-year uh, sea grant DEI vision. So nothing more to add. It's a work in progress. And, and I'll add from the chat, uh, Judy Gray says that um, perhaps we should embrace or track the fact that sea grant is a pathway. So even if it's not a destination for specific groups of people, measuring success as a pathway by tracking where people end up in their contributions, uh, whatever those might be. So thank you for that, Judy. That is an excellent, excellent point. Uh, okay, so uh, question, Jane, uh, and I'm gonna uh, take creative license as the question asker and put a little something in here uh, because we heard from Brandon about belonging as well as justice. Uh, and the current C grant plan is uh, DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So the question asks, is the national C grant program or the DEI group planning to address justice and or belonging uh, relative to, um, to our work? Yeah, great question. We have added some, uh, you know, thoughts, especially on justice in the new plan. 
um, as it's become, you know, I think a word on, on many of our minds and hearts and not something that we really focused on much in our 2018 version. So I would definitely, you know, would say that as a gap. Um, there's a lot of great work um, from scholars, you know, certainly at least going as far back as the 70s. Um, and we've looked to, you know, how does the EPA define, for example, environmental justice or injustice? And I think justice really is very well connected to equity. And so that access to resources. Um, and so we're kind of, you know, parsing through, you know, what's the language to use? Um, you know, in my own, my own opinion is that, um, you know, Sea Grant programs, uh, we can't necessarily, you know, create a just world or, you know, recreate the world. Um, but we can be, you know, again, kind of that, that pathway or um, facilitator um, towards more just um, opportunities for the communities that we work in. Um, you know, one way that we originally described um, some of our DEI goals related to extension work is everyone having a voice in the room. But what about everyone having meaningful, you know, participation um, in the process? And so I think we're starting to uh, maybe be a little more uh, aggressive and thoughtful in what that language is. That's great. Thank you, Jane. Uh, one last question for you, a clarifying question. Uh, somebody said that they missed the environmental survey, I guess the climate survey that the DEI group uh, shared. You wanna talk about that for a second? Yeah, that was in 2018. Um, I apologize, I can't recall the response rate. I know we had about, I think our total population was 800 Sea Grant staff and maybe, oh, Mona, do you remember? It was less than 30% response rate, but it was something that we did uh, back in 2018 to collect that baseline uh, data for, you know, who we are, where we stand, and hopefully, in, uh, you know, in, in a year or two, we'll probably do, do that again. Yeah, it's definitely part of the, you know, plan is to do these, you know, surveys to try to evaluate success over time. Um, but, you know, for most of us, this is kind of on top of our regular work. Um, so getting to those next steps um, will take longer if we don't have dedicated staff time to, to these efforts. Uh, thanks for that, Jane and Mona. Um, Jane, you set us up really nicely for the next question, which I think both you and Brandon can address. Uh, so uh, keeping with our stew metaphor, uh, not stewing, but creating a warm, cozy stew, how do we keep these efforts moving forward uh, in a thoughtful way and not rush them? Uh, so Jane, you want to start and then Brandon, maybe you can uh, add anything to that question about how to how to keep Jedi, be Jedi moving forward. Yeah, um, no, it's really important, I think, to give everyone space to kind of be where they are on these topics. Not everyone, you know, is uh kind of ready to go i'll say it whole hog <laughs> and it takes time uh to i mean it took time for me to to learn it took time for me to think through what what do these words even mean i'm continually coming up with new ways to understand some of these topics so um i think within individual state sea grant programs you know everyone has to kind of consider what is our culture existing um, what's our kind of willingness to get into this and how do we do it in a way that kind of whets the appetite, you know, serve an hors d'oeuvre perhaps, instead of like, you know, a big, you know, hunk of meat, <laughs> get people a little more, uh, you know, ready to go um, and, and build it over time in a way that I think reflects, you know, again, the culture of your own program. Thank you, Jane. Uh, Brandon, anything to add there? Yeah, I, um, I, I agree 100% with Jane. Um, it, it is specific to where you are, what you're doing. And I will say something that we don't talk about a lot when we're, when we're talking about Jedi is generational diversity. Uh, we, we gender, race, ethnicity, and, and such. But, uh, and I, I bring that up because the younger generations are not going to wait 
the younger generations do not use language like, well, let's take our time. They're not, they're just not going to do it. Uh, and they're not doing it. <laughs> so if you look on social media, you look, I mean, they, they are moving forward in professional societies. They're creating their own groups. They, they are pushing for culture change on their campuses. So, uh, and it doesn't take long. It just takes will, you know, so I showed that document from 1972 in my, so that was 48 years ago, almost 49. And nothing happened kind of in the earth system sciences. And then eight months of 2020, look where we are. So 48 beers versus eight months. It doesn't take long. It just takes people to, uh, to, to, to have the will to do it. But to Jane's point, uh, everyone's at different phases and we have to meet them where they are and give them space and time to catch up um, or become learned or educated about what's going on too. That's great, Brandon, thank you. And you did a wonderful job uh, teeing off the next question, which you're gonna start with. And then Jane, you can uh, fill in anything uh, that you wanna add here. So. Uh, this one cuts right to the heart of it. Uh, Brandon, how do we get leadership to buy in for Jedi or be Jedi initiatives? What are some thoughts on how to how to move it up the chain rather than just as a grassroots? How do we get how do we get that leadership buy in? That that is the question, isn't it? Um, I can give the I'll give two answers. I'll give the the formal NSF um, answer <laughs> first. Um, which is uh, continue to build relationships with those individuals, uh, continue to encourage them to leverage their social and professional and academic capital, um, provide to them the scholarship on why and how di diverse teams uh, and, and or groups are much more productive. Um, and it's, it's really not about giving pieces of pie to anyone else and taking from someone else. Uh, that's a two dimensional way of thinking. Many of us think about the pie just getting deeper and, and not, it may not get broader, but it will get deeper. So it, it, people will have what they, what they need. The cynical answer is um, you just fertilize and overseed and the weeds will die out. So I'll leave it at that. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. So we've gone from a cooking stew metaphor to a gardening metaphor, perhaps reflecting how we are spending our time now that we are socially isolating. Um, Jane, any insights or thoughts from you on how to get leadership buy-in for Jedi initiatives? Um, no, I think Brandon said it, said it great there. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Okay. Uh, there is one last question uh that i see so i'm going to ask this uh jane you can start with this one and then brandon i think this is also one of those cuts to the heart of the matter questions is uh you know this i think is coming from uh a c grant perspective um but how do we reach uh those diverse populations when hiring uh you know the we hear this a lot in science as well beyond c grant is our applicant pools aren't diverse and so it's challenging to improve on diversity of staff. So uh, Jane, any thoughts on how to, how to access that talent pool? Yeah, well, um, my PhD dissertation was about social capital and social networks. Um, so that, maybe that's part of the reason I'm interested in, in these topics around diversity because I think so much, so much of it is, is just who we know and who we're getting the information out to. Um, if we put out our, um, you know, opportunities in our standard channels, we'll get what we've been getting. Um, <laughs> we'll get the same applicant pool year after year. If we don't have any relationships with organizations that represent, um, you know, people of color, underrepresented groups, underserved groups, well, they probably won't know about us. Um, so I think it just goes back to the basics. Um, you know, Sea Grant, we really... Um, you know, I think one of our great strengths 
are the authentic, meaningful, you know, sustained relationships that we have with coastal communities. And so I think we have to do just a little bit of reflection of which communities do we have those relationships with and which have we systematically not built. And for those where we haven't built, you know, we have to put some resources and time there and with a little bit of what we already know how to do, relationship building, I think, think we'll get there relatively fast. Thank you, Jane. Brandon gave you a plus 1000 uh, on your comment. Anything additional to add here, Brandon? I'll, I'll leave with another metaphor since I'm in that frame right now. Um, I, I'm not gonna go to San Francisco Bay and look for blue crabs. So if I want blue crabs, I gotta go where they are. Uh, and but but Jane said it much more uh, delicately and diplomatically diplomatically than I did. Uh, if we're advertising those opportunities in the same channels and not uh, the, to use her exact words and and not having or connecting the uh, to those groups where or, or organizations where there might be a broader a swath of individuals involved, then you uh, as Jane said, you we're going to continue to get what we get. So. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Jane. Uh, comment in the chat uh, saying thank you for the metaphor about fertilizing to eliminate weeds, Brandon. It's an apt image and that we should be actively fertilizing. Uh, so I guess that's what happens to the stew, right? Then it becomes the fertilizer, all the stuff that you don't actually put in the pot, you put in your compost. Anyway, this gardening metaphor is getting out of hand. Um, so we are, this officially concludes the panel presentation section of this session. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Melissa, who is going to give you all the uh, instructions for our next, uh, next stage, but it does include a brief break. So um, please remember to come back after the break. Uh, and Melissa will tell you what we're doing at that stage. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much, Brandon and Jane, for your presentations. They're really great. I, you know, really learned a lot in those aspects, especially considering, you know, we're at the Washington Sea Grant really reflecting on where we are with our journey and, and um, we've definitely got some tools from this discussion. So thank you so much. Uh, please don't go too far. We're not going to take that long of a break. We really want you to stick around and um, participate in these discussions. We really only need a couple minutes to kind of make sure everyone gets to where they are meant to be. But uh, before we do that, we're, we're, we're intending to have about 20 minutes in a smaller group breakout discussions. And there are a couple of questions that we will hope that you reflect on with one another. Uh, the Folks who have been facilitating, moderating thus far will serve as kind of float folks. So we will kind of, if I'm um, jump in and out as uh, just to offer any kinds of support that you may need while you're in these small group discussions, particularly because we have so many folks online, we aren't able to assign facilitators with each of them. So we hope that within your group of four or five, you can take an opportunity to select somebody in your group who can serve as that facilitator. And we wanted to remind you of a couple of agreements that uh, Sarah had sent out within, when she sent information about the Zoom, uh, because we wanna be mindful about the space we're creating in these small group discussions. So um, these are, you know, that there's a facilitator role and that's to ensure that the goals and objectives of your conversation are accomplished and that everyone gets a chance to participate in a meaningful way, um, really reflecting on something that Jane mentioned earlier. Um, the pass agreement, if you wish to not respond to a question, please feel free to just say pass um, or pass for now. We have a co the confidentiality agreement, which is I'll only speak on my own experience um, outside of this session. And I will not tell what anyone else in the group has said, even uh, in a disguised way. The personal speaking agreement, which is I will speak personally all the way through. That is for myself and not for other individuals present or absent or for any group. And then finally, the time limit agreement. I will stick strictly to the time limits, making sure that all of us have equal time for speaking and listening. This discussion is 20 minutes total, uh, so please use your comments accordingly to that. So these groups will be randomized 
Um, we will share the questions in the chat box with you once we get into our breakout group, breakout groups, excuse me. Um, but we will start off with uh, questions around um, how does your C grant program institutionalize these concepts of JEDI and DEI? And uh, what are you doing to help develop and deepen your own DEI learning? Uh, finally, the last, the last piece here is that we really want everyone to have an opportunity to kind of share any key takeaways or topics that they wish were covered today, but they didn't, they want to learn more about. If you go back to that poll everywhere uh, link that I, that we sent earlier, I think Sarah or somebody else will put that back into the chat. There's a question there for you to anonymously submit either throughout the breakout groups or after the breakout group. Um, any responses you have to what is one key takeaway that you learned or an additional question that you have from your breakout group discussion. Um, I know there's a lot of information. Again, we're here to help out uh, as needed. So um, we will kind of take, take a couple of minutes just to get to our groups. And let's see, coming back at 1.30 um, collectively just for a brief close of the session. Thank you all. Oh, and finally, I'm going to pause recording. Um, none of the breakout groups discussions will be recorded. So don't worry about that. <laughs>